Amen. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. So I've been preparing you for um, Leviticus chapter 16 for a couple of weeks. I've been bringing up the Day of Atonement, um, particularly in Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23 talks about the Day of Atonement. It talks about when it's supposed to be and um, who's supposed to do it and things like that. But Leviticus chapter 16 is actually the details of what happens in the Day of Atonement. But let's look at Colossians chapter 1 first. So we're studying through the book of Colossians, and we're picking up from last week. We talked about um, Epaphras and the witness that he brought back to Paul. Um, we're going to pick up in verse number 12 um, this evening and look at uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 12. Keep your place in Leviticus chapter 16. I'm sorry, I don't think I, for, I told you to do that, but keep your place in Leviticus chapter 16. We'll go back there um, in a minute. But look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 12. The Bible says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers the partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Translating means we've been changed in some way into the kingdom of his, his dear son. Of course, we're talking about Jesus here, capital S. And look at verse number 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of of sin. So here the Bible is telling us in Colossians chapter 1 that we've been delivered from the power of darkness. We've been translated um, by um, into the kingdom of his dear son, of Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, through the blood of Jesus is what this is talking about, even the forgiveness of sin. So this evening what I want to look at is I want to look at the blood of Jesus. I want to look at the blood of Jesus. What does this mean? Um, how how is it that we have redemption through his blood, through the blood of Jesus? Now, in order to understand this, we have to understand Leviticus chapter 16. We have to understand um, what's happening in Leviticus chapter 16, the details of Leviticus chapter 16. If we just, we just read through it, and if you were thinking, boy, this sounds really complicated, Leviticus chapter 13, everything that was, or chapter, chapter 16, everything that was happening there, let me just... First of all, I think maybe 50 sermons could be preached on just Leviticus chapter 16, on the Day of Atonement. So once a year, the high priest was to do this. So let me just simplify the Day of Atonement for you on this evening. If you want to take some notes and put them in Leviticus chapter 16 tonight, I think that that will help you the next time you go through your Bible. But basically in Leviticus chapter 16, here's what's going on. You have Aaron, who is the high priest. At this point. So the high priest, whoever he is at the time, is going to do everything in this chapter one time a year. It's going to be once a year. So what Aaron does is he puts on um, holy garments, the Bible says. He is going to go into the temple. There's two chambers in the temple. There's the regular part of the temple, and then there's the, the holy place of the temple. That was separating the normal place of the temple by a veil. Okay, it's important to know that that was separated by a veil. Inside the holy place where Aaron was to go was the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant on the lid was what was called the mercy seat. Okay, so Aaron, there, it's important to know if you, you, you think about Leviticus chapter 16, you think about the rams and the goats and the bullock, there's five animals involved. Okay, there's five animals involved. There's one bull, there's two rams, and there's two goats, okay? There's five animals. Now, one bull and one ram are for the priest himself, okay? So the bull is an offering for the sins of the priest, okay? So Aaron has to offer for his own sins because he's a man, right? He's a man like everybody else. You say, he's the high priest, but for all have sinned. So he's a man, he has to offer for his own sins. So he has a sin offering, and then he has what is called a burnt offering. So Aaron has a bull for his sin offering, and then he has a ram for his burnt offering. That is for Aaron, the high priest, personally. That has nothing to do with the children of Israel. The other three animals are two goats, okay? Two goats. One goat is a sin offering for the people, for the people, and then the other goat is what is called a scapegoat, okay? It is a scapegoat for the people. All right, and then, of course, the other ram 
is a burnt offering for the people. Okay? So you say, what is this sin offering and this scapegoat? So what the scapegoat is, is what Aaron would do with the sin offering for the people. They would cast lots. And a lot of people have, have uh, made a comparison to Jesus and Barnabas um, with the scapegoat. And, the, you know, and that's, that may be. But the, the most important thing I need to show you tonight is in Leviticus chapter 16, we're going to compare this to Jesus, this entire chapter. Okay? So you say, which one is Jesus? I'm going to tell you um, tonight. Okay? So the sin offering is the, the, the offering that is killed and the blood is put on the mercy seat for the people. All right? So Aaron, what does he do? We got these five animals. We know what these five animals are for. He puts on holy garments, first of all. He washes himself, and he puts on holy garments. Super important there, too. Okay? He puts on holy garments to go into, enters into the veil. And then he has to burn um, smoke and incense so he can't because God was present there. And, you know, you're not to see God. It says, so he wouldn't die. He had to do that. Okay, so he puts on the holy garments, and then he goes in, and then he offers the sin offering for himself, and he sprinkles the blood of the bullock on the mercy seat, and then he sprinkles the blood of the, the goat of the sin offering of the people on the mercy seat as well. You say, what about the other goat? The other goat he was to then perform after he put the blood on the mercy seat for himself and the congregation. He was then to lay hands on, on the other goat, and this was called the scapegoat, and this represented, and then this goat, he laid hands on this goat, and this goat was taken away into a far deserted place, you know, never to be seen again. And it was representative of the people's sins being taken far away from them. Okay? So look down. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. So that is the gist of what Aaron does. He puts on the holy garments. He goes in and he does the sin offerings where he slays the animal and puts their blood on the mercy seat. Then he comes out of the holy place. He gets rid of the scapegoat and he sends the scapegoat off. And then after this, this is super important, after this, he removes the holy garments and then we do the burnt offerings. So the burnt offerings are what? They're the two rams, one burnt offering, was for um, Aaron, and one burnt offering was for the people. So it's interesting, it's not just the burnt offerings, it's also the fat of the sin offerings. So you'll notice if you look down at Leviticus chapter 16, and you look at verse 27, he's taking, he said the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth without the camp. And they shall burn in the fire their skins, their flesh, and their dung. This is just them getting rid of the carcasses here. This isn't anything being put on the, on the uh, altar. It says, you know, up in verse 24, he will offers the burnt offering of the people and for himself. And then in verse 25, you see, he takes the fat of the sin offering. So they remove the fat of the sin offering, and they take the burnt offerings. That's the burnt offering for the Lord. It's basically like three, two animals plus the fat of the two sin offerings. Okay? So that, all that to say this. That happens after the blood was put on the mercy seat and after the holy garments were removed. Okay? And that's important. You say, why is that important? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. And look, this is, there's a lot here. I understand that. But turn to Hebrews chapter 9. We're talking about the blood of Christ. We're talking about the blood of Christ this evening. So look at Hebrews chapter 9 and look at verse number 7. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to be in Hebrews a lot tonight. Hebrews tells us um, kind of is the, is the key to a lot of this in the Old Testament that makes sense for us. And by the way, I believe that the book of Hebrews is proof that Paul gave, was given extra revelation by Jesus Christ. Because there's simply no other way that Paul could have known all these things um, from just the Old Testament. I'll show you that this evening. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 7. But in the second, but into the second went the high priest alone once a year. The second means into that holy place, that second chamber. But guess what? He didn't go in there without blood. It says, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Those are the two, that's, that's the, the bullock and the, the sin goat. The goat that got, you know, that drew the short straw, so to speak, and the one that gets killed. Look at verse number 9 of Hebrews chapter 9. Now, this is super important. You need to underline these two words in your Bible because 
The Bible will use different words to describe the same thing, but this is a concept that you must understand about the New Testament. Verse number 9 of Hebrews 9, which was, by him doing this, which was a figure. Make sure you underline those two words right there. For the time then present. So it says when Aaron went in, when the high priest went in, and he, he killed those two animals, and he put that blood on the mercy seat, that was a figure for that time. What do you mean a figure? I'll get to that in a minute. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him, that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal, or, cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. The time of reformation is Jesus Christ coming. Is Jesus Christ, basically the time of reformation is when Jesus Christ says, it is finished. That's the time when everything was reformed at that point. I'll show you that in a minute. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 in verse number 11. You say, now, now, why Leviticus 16? Leviticus 16 is so important because Jesus is in Leviticus 16. Look at verse number 11 of Hebrews 9. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. That, that means the temple, the tabernacle. Not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So now the Bible introduces something different here. The Bible says that Jesus is a high priest. Now look at, at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 5. So Jesus is, it's saying, it's, it's a greater, there's a greater, more perfect tabernacle, first of all, and Jesus is the high priest of that tabernacle. All right, it's, it's not of this building. It's not the one that we're talking about with Aaron. It's a different one. Look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 5. Focusing on, on Jesus where it says in verse number 11 of Hebrews 9 that Jesus was the high priest. Look at Hebrews 5, verse number 5. So also Christ glorified him not, not himself to be made an high priest. It says he didn't make himself a high priest. But he said that, but he that said unto him, thou art my son, Today have I begotten thee. So the Bible here says, God the Father made Jesus the high priest. Okay? Look at verse number 6. As he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Mekil say, what in the world? Go to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 20. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 20. So now we have something different introduced. We see that Jesus is the high priest of, of a different tabernacle, not the one that we're talking about in the Old Testament, a different one. And he's also a priest, you know, that is in the order or after the order of Melchizedek. Look at verse number 20 of Hebrews chapter 6. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is not a high priest, uh, you know, until he dies. Jesus is not a high priest because the high priest replaced after, you know, death caused a new high priest to be needed in the Old Testament. It says Jesus is a high priest forever. Go to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 1. Who is this Melchizedek that we keep talking about? Look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 1. Let's get some clarity on this. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 1. The Bible says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a, a priest continually. Turn to Genesis chapter 14. This is how we know Paul was taught by Jesus and given more revelation by Jesus. This is a big one right here. Look at Genesis chapter 14. The Bible talks about this man, Melchizedek, in Genesis chapter 14. And Paul is just giving us all kinds of more detail about who Melchizedek really was in the Old Testament. Look at verse number 18. This is right after Abraham has rescued Lot and he's won these great battles. Look at Genesis 14 and verse number 18. The Bible says, this is what we get in the Old Testament. If all you had was the Old Testament, this right here is what you know about Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, 
and he was the priest of the Most High God. So right there in verse 18, you know, I mean, you could know that Melchizedek was very special. We're, this is way before the Levitical priesthood, folks. You know, there was no high priest at this point. And the Bible here says that he was the king of Salem, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Well, the Bible in Hebrews chapter 5, 6, and 7 is saying that the order of Melchizedek is an eternal priesthood. So it's an eternal priesthood of which Jesus is the eternal high priest. Guess what? We see here an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament is what we are seeing. Look at verse number 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. So that's kind of a, you also need the New Testament to kind of understand that, but it's Abraham gave Melchizedek tithes of all. If you remember, Abraham knew who this guy was too. Because if you remember, Abraham, you know, he didn't really want anything of the, of the spoils, but he gives this guy, you know, 10% of everything um, that he got in the spoils of that war. So look, Jesus is the high priest, and this is an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Go back to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 12. Let's go back to the blood. So what do we see so far? We see that these things that they're doing in Leviticus chapter 16, all these rituals and all these animals and all these sacrifices, these are a figure. These are a figure of things that are to come at the Reformation, which is the time of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the blood. And we see that Jesus pictures or is a figure of the high priest. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. I'm sorry, the high priest is a figure of Jesus Christ. Let me get that um, switched around. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 12. Let's go back to the blood. But look at what the Bible says here. It says, but neither by the blood of goats and calves. So this is talking about the sacrifices, the sin sacrifices of the bull and the, uh, and the goats on the mercy seat. It says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. So Jesus is a high priest, and what, he, what they did in the Old Testament was a figure of what he was really going to do. So we see he's the real high priest, the eternal high priest, and it's not by the blood of goats and calves the way Jesus did it. No, he did it with his own blood entering once into the holy place. That's super important there, that Jesus entered once. What did they do in the Old Testament? They did it once a year, again and again and again. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse number 1. Now here, underline these three words. This is another, another um, three words that are describing how the Old Testament pictures what Jesus is to do. For the law, underline this, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never be with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually to make the comers thereunto perfect. It's saying the law, it says the law, it's, it can't, it's, it's a shadow. What they were doing in the Old Testament is a shadow, is a figure, is what we read a few minutes ago, of the good things to come. So what God was doing in the Old Testament is he's just, He's projecting a shadow. He's projecting what he's really going to do to solve this problem once and for all. Look at verse 2. For then, I mean, if they weren't a shadow, if they weren't a shadow, look at verse 2. For then why would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. Look, if it, if it was the real deal and it really took away sin, I mean, this really shows you, by the way, this shows you the eternal security nature of God, if that makes sense. Because what he's saying here is that, no, this was just a picture to remind people of what he's really going to do. He's saying, because look, if God was really going to fix it through the bull and the goat, it's like, he, he, the way God works, you don't have to do it once. But that's what Jesus did. And they would have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there was remembrance again made of sins every year. You guess what? You know what? Here's another thing you should get from reading the Bible. God likes remembrance. God likes us to remember things. These things do what? Why do we do the Lord's Supper? Because it turns into Jesus' blood and his body? No. It's to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's why we do the, the Lord's Supper. The blood of Jesus. So what we see here. For it is not possible, verse 4, 
I mean, this is the one, this, the, this sums it up right here. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. And I'm going to tell you why it's not possible in a few minutes. But it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So look, Jesus is the eternal priest. Okay? Jesus is the eternal priest. He's the one that goes into the holy place. Not the holy place of the tabernacle, a different holy place. And also Jesus, is he, he, he provides the blood as well. So he's the priest and he's the blood. He provides, the, he's the sacrifice itself. Look at Hebrews 9. Go back to Hebrews 9 and look at verse 19, or verse 13. Because it's not possible. It was just a shadow, just a picture. Look at verse 13 of Hebrews 9. For if, blood, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the, of the flesh, it's saying if, if these things you know, would sanctify people year after year after year for a remembrance, for a picture, for a shadow, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Go to Genesis, um, go to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 19. I'm going to read for you. Um, look, here's the thing. Blood is necessary for covenants with God. Blood is necessary for covenants with God. You're going to make a deal with God, blood is necessary. If God is going to make a covenant to you. Even in Genesis chapter 3, when, you know, the, everything changed for Adam and Eve. And what did it say? Had to have, God made skins for them. God made skins and clothed. He made coats of skins and clothed them. Now, I mean, you can imply at that point that some animal, something had to die in order for them to have those skins. Look at verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 9. For when Moses had spoken every... So we, we, we're looking at the blood again and how blood is necessary for a covenant with God. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law... He took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Moses did this too, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. There can be no forgiveness of sins without blood. Turn to Luke chapter 22. So there could be no, no covenant with God. There can be no New Testament, if you will, with God without blood. And Jesus said this himself, even before he died. He said in Luke chapter 22, in verse number 20, look what he said. He said, likewise also, the cup after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant. In what? In my blood, which is shed for you. So folks, the blood had to be shed in order for there to be a new covenant. So we see, turn to Galatians chapter 3. Jesus is the whole picture of Leviticus chapter 16. You say, what is Jesus in, where's Jesus in Leviticus chapter 16? Well, I guess aside from the bull, which wasn't needed, and aside from, you know, the sin offering for the priest, and aside from, you know, the goat for the, or the ram, the burnt offering for the priest, Jesus was everything. He was, he was everything. He was even the priest's clothing. Jesus is pictured. Jesus takes all, I mean, just think of, think of the, the machine of Leviticus chapter 16. You think about all the parts, the clothing, the animals, the, the, you know, the, the ritual, the burnt offering, everything, and we'll get to that in a minute. But Jesus encompassed in what he did in his life and who he was and what he sacrificed, everything, the whole chapter. Just circle Leviticus chapter 16 and put an arrow that says Jesus because he encompassed the whole chapter. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. He was also the priest's clothing. Because guess what? The priest couldn't go into the Holy of Holies. He couldn't go into the holy place without wearing these special clothes. Why would God do that? Because it's a picture. It's a shadow. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 27. It's a figure. All this is for us. All this is so when Jesus comes and he did what he was going to do, we could recognize it and say it fits perfectly. Look at Galatians 3.27. For ye are all the children of God 
by faith in Christ Jesus. Everybody who's got faith in Christ Jesus is a child of God. Look at verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We, that is how we are going to enter into heaven. Just as the priests entered into the presence of God, this is also, and I can read you verse after verse after verse on this, but we will enter into heaven because we are putting on Christ's righteousness and God will not see our own. Thank God. And that is how a sinner can enter into heaven. What about the scapegoat? Was Jesus the scapegoat too? Yes, Jesus was the scapegoat. Turn to Psalm 103. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? He re, I mean, didn't he remove our sin from us? And look at Psalm 103. Look at verse number 12. Psalm 103, verse number 12. The scapegoat also pictures what Jesus did. Look at verse number 12 of Psalm 103. The Bible says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. So Jesus, he's the, he's the animal blood. He's the priest. He's the clothing. I mean, he's everything. And you know what? He's also the burnt offering. He's also the burnt offering. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. It's interesting to note, you know, it's, in, it's, 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 it's interesting to note for people who don't believe that Jesus' soul um, went to hell, but it's interesting to note when the burnt offering took place. So the priest goes in and he offers his blood on the mercy seat or not, he, he offers the blood of the sin offering on the mercy seat. Then he comes out, and the scapegoat is released. Then he removes his clothes, and then he goes and burns the burnt offering. It's, it's like the last thing that happens is the burnt offering. Look at Acts chapter 2. I need to turn there. Look at Acts chapter 2, and look at verse number 31. Now, I'm not, this is a whole sermon in itself. I'm not going to, I'll preach a sermon on this sometime. But I just want to show you that the Bible says in Acts 2.31, he's seeing this before, this is talking about a prophecy of David, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh did see corruption. So G who's, David's flesh saw corruption. This is talking about Jesus Christ. His soul came out of hell before the resurrection. Super important there too. Now look, go to Matthew chapter 27. A lot of people have problems with, you know, um, the, the doctrine. And I, I, I don't think so many people have to have problems with this because I don't really see um, the issues. A lot of people have problems with, Jesus said it is finished. Jesus said it is finished. Go to Matthew chapter 27. So how could, you know, Jesus have still gone to hell? You know, how could his soul have gone to hell at that point? Well, look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 51. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 51 well, actually, go to verse number 50. The Bible says Jesus, well, this is right before Jesus dies on the cross, right before he physically dies, it says Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Look, he died right here. He physically died at this moment. But he, he cried something. He cried something with a loud voice. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. In verse number 50, if you go to John 19.30, I can just give it away from you, but the words that he said in, when, he, when he spoke out in John, or Matthew chapter 27, in verse number 50, is the words he cried out is, it is finished. And as soon as he said, and if you want to cross-reference that, just write right next to there, John 19.30. And that's where Jesus says, it is finished, and then he dies. But ex immediately after Jesus says, it is finished, what happens? The, the veil rips in half in the temple. What is the veil? The veil is what separated the people from God. That is what is finished. That testament, that covenant, Jesus is saying, it is over. It is done now. It is over. That veil was ripped. It was torn. And that was the fulfillment of that. Now, now we no longer, look. The Bible says that he broke down that middle wall of partition for us. We do not need that anymore. We do not need that veil anymore. That's why it ripped in half. It wasn't just a coincidence. Okay, that was finished at that point. 
So look at all, it makes sense. And if you want to get into more details about it, I mean, think about, okay, when did, you know, was there a, you know, was there a, a you know, an, a, 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 actually Jesus sprinkling his blood on the mercy seat in heaven? I mean, I think so. I mean, a lot of people think the Bible doesn't specifically say Jesus walked in at this time. But look, it was all a picture of everything that was happening in heaven. And look, Revelation chapter 11, look, turn there. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19 tells us that there is a temple in heaven. So there must be, you know, there must be a mercy seat in heaven. I mean, this is just inferring. But look at Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. The Bible says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in this temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hell. This is, of course, the end times, but look, it's there. It's there. The ark is there. Meaning, must have a mercy seat there. So, look, Jesus offered the sin off. I mean, isn't it possible that, I mean, if we're really going to, and I don't typically do this because people will get in really strange arguments over details that the Bible doesn't really give us, but isn't it possible since Aaron put on the garments, goes in there, sprinkles the blood on the mercy seat, comes back out, then he does the burnt offerings, that Jesus, you know, it kind of makes sense that Jesus told the thief on the cross that, hey, today you'll be with me in paradise. We believe that means heaven. So that Jesus died on the cross, went to heaven, did the blood on the mercy seat, and then he took care of the burnt offering after that. Isn't that possible? Because the Bible says that he came out of, his soul came out of hell before he rose again. So that was the last thing that he did. I mean, that's just my opinion. And if somebody has, you know, they reordered this in their mind or whatever, I mean, I don't have any problem with that. But I mean, it seems to match. Because the, the arguments that you'll see against, you know, people, you know, if Jesus went to hell, how could he have said that, you know, to the thief that you'll be with me today in paradise? Well, I mean, you're kind of splitting hairs there. It's totally possible that that's how it happened. But look, go back to, um, go to Genesis chapter 4. So, back to the blood. Back to the blood. So the point, all that to say this. Jesus encompasses everything in Leviticus chapter 16. He is the perfect priest. He only needed to be, he only needed to do the sacrifice once because he's an eternal priest. Look at Genesis chapter 4. So he encompasses all of Leviticus chapter 16. But let me just conclude a few things that we've learned about blood. First of all, blood must be shed for an acceptable sacrifice. The Bible teaches that again and again and again. Look at Cain in Genesis chapter 4 and verse number 3. Look what the Bible says. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. He, he was a farmer. So he brought some fruits and vegetables or whatever. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. And what? And the fat. And the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So he didn't, it's not that he didn't like Cain, it's not that he didn't, you know, it, like what he did for a living, it's just there wasn't, there has to be blood in a sacrifice that would be acceptable to God. It's, it's very simple. There was no blood in fruits and vegetables. Go back to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Go back to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse number 22. Let's recap verse number 22, then we'll go on to verse number 23. The Bible says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. We've just read that. It is therefore necessary that here is this, here it is again. Underline this, that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Look, it makes sense, right? I mean, what's going to be a better temple? The one in heaven or the one that we built? I mean, it was a tent with a veil at the time we were talking about Aaron. The tabernacle was a tent. So it has to be a better sacrifice. But it's all about the patterns that God was showing us, the figures, the shadows, all the same thing. The figures, the shadows, the patterns. Verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. He didn't go into the one in the temple on earth, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. So this is Revelation eleven nineteen, 19, you know, being shown to us in Hebrews chapter 9. It says the figures of the true. So it is true that there's a, a tabernacle, there's a temple in heaven. 
but into heaven itself, it tells us the location of it, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Where was God in the Old Testament? He was on the mercy seat. Okay, so it's exactly the picture, the figure, the pattern, the shadow of what Jesus actually did, of the true. Those are great words right there. These were all figures of the true, of the real thing that God was going to do. But why? So you say, so do you believe me now that there's no remission without blood, that there had to be blood, that Jesus had to bleed and be that, that sacrifice, but there had to be blood? Turn to Leviticus chapter 17. So why the blood? Why? Think about this for a second. I mean, why did God make it this way? I mean, God's making the rules, is he not? Why is the blood needed? Have you ever thought about that? Look at Leviticus chapter 17. Before you look down in Leviticus chapter 17, think about the situation we're in, first of all. You say, God is pretty obsessed over blood here. I mean, I think that, I mean, I didn't even read you a tenth of the verses in the Bible that have to do with the blood of Christ, with blood, you know, being sacrificed for us, with we're covered by the blood, all these things. Look, why the blood? Well, think about the situation we're in. The wages, I mean, I'm, I'm a sinner. The wages of my sin is what? What have I earned for my sin? I have earned death. You have earned death. You have earned death for your sin. And guess what? Look at Leviticus chapter 17 and verse number 11. Leviticus chapter 17, look at verse number 11. For the life of the flesh is in breathing. The life of the flesh is in your skin, and in eating healthy food, is in... Do no, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it unto you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Because the, the blood is life. So you have a problem called death, and blood is life. That is why blood is required. Now, look, this is science in the Bible here. I mean, if only, if only George Washington's doctors would have known Leviticus chapter 17 and verse number 11, they wouldn't have bled the man to death. Because, I mean, look, the, the Bible is a scientific book. I don't know how many times I, I like to show that to you, but look, let me give you some science on just blood. The Bible says life of the flesh is in the blood. If you knew that and somebody got sick, would you start draining their life from them? And obviously that we've found that this was an error in medical science. You know, another lesson that we should all learn is that, you know, the medical profession is wrong a lot. Look at, the, look at what the bio, or, uh, science says about the blood. Blood carries oxygen throughout your body with red blood cells. So inside your blood are these red blood cells, and they carry the oxygen. When you breathe, it doesn't just go into your body. The blood is what uses, you know, it, it circulates the oxygen to your muscles, to your organs. The blood, it not only does that, it not only carries oxygen to your, around your body, it also transports CO2 and waste products to the organs that need those things. It's like, it's like this super smart delivery organization in your body. It, it takes the oxygen to everywhere it needs to go, and then it takes the waste products and drops those waste products at every single place that they need to go, so your kidneys and your liver and all these different organs can get rid of these wastes. That's all through the blood in your body. I mean, how in the world could you be a scientist or a medical, I mean, a medical scientist, a real, you know, a, a physicist, I mean, and not believe in God. After you see these things, you must be completely blinded. Plasma in your blood transports nutrients and waste around the body to the organs that need them. More deliveries. White blood cells fight bacteria and viruses. And you don't have that many white blood cells, but white blood cells are super smart where they detect something foreign and then they reproduce themselves. And they create these antibodies. That, that go out and fight the foreign invader in your body. Then you got these cool things called platelets. Like if you actually get like a bleed or something, these platelets are going around in your blood and they're like, they're like a radiator stop leak. And all the platelets, they rush to the hole to plug the hole so you don't lose the blood. I mean, just think about how amazing all this is. I mean, it's, it's truly amazing. I mean, and you know, we think... 
This is why, like, if anything your body is able to handle, you know, let your body handle it. And it's also why we're seeing that natural immunity, and we will continue to see that natural immunity is so much better than anything that can be invented to stick inside you. But back to the, the point of the sermon. I don't want to get off on, on that. It's life for life in the Bible. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. We have a problem because of our sin that we deserve death. And the Bible says, and we can see through science, that blood itself represents life. The opposite of death. So it's a perfect picture. It's a perfect picture. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 19. Look at verse 21. Look at verse Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 21. The Bible says, and thine eye shall not pity. So this is, this, I, I'm showing you this to show you what's fair. This is God's law, and this will define what's fair for you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. This is talking about the context here. It's talking about someone who has borne false witness against somebody. But it's such a nice context because you could bear false witness. I could go to uh, and accuse Brother Matt of something that could get him put to death. I could accuse Brother Matt of, of murder. And if somebody believes me and he gets sentenced guilty to murder, he, he will be put to death. Maybe not in this state. But according to the Bible, that's what should happen. That's what would be fair. The Bible here is saying that if I'm lying about him, if I'm lying about him and I am actually trying to take his life from him, that my life is owed. And what that, and then of course, lower, you know, eye for eye, hand for hand, foot for foot. But the point being is that God requires life for life. And we owe death. We owe our lives because of our sin. And he requires life for life. That is why the blood is needed to take away transgressions for remission of sins. And guess what? When Jesus Christ became the high priest and gave his eternal blood for us, look, that's a blood transfusion that we'll never forget. That's an eternal blood transfusion right there. And it's, look, that is why blood is required, life for life. And all the bulls and the goats, and I mean, you, you, you get tired of like, I mean, them, they're just slaughtering bulls and goats everywhere in Leviticus. And it's just a picture of your ultimate salvation through the eternal blood. It's sealed with eternal blood. And guess what? Eternal blood, eternal life. It's just, it's such a, how you cannot believe in eternal security means you just have an utter misunderstanding of what the Bible says, about everything that the Bible pictures. I mean, Hebrews is literally saying that this, that this, I mean, Hebrews is literally saying these people that believe that you just have to keep confessing your sins. This is how I grew up. You got to go to church and confess your sins. Wipe that slate clean. This is the Catholics. This is the Lutherans. This is all the, the Pentecostals or whoever. That you just got to keep, keep staying right or getting right again and again and again. Look, they're still in the Old Testament. They're still in the Old Testament. No, it's a new covenant. And it's eternal. It's the perfect solution is what it is. And look, it's the only one that could possibly make any sense. So go back to Colossians chapter 1 and look at verse number 14. And now hopefully this makes more sense. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 14. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 14. Let's read it again. In whom we have, this is in Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Look, through his eternal blood, through his one-time sacrifice. And then, of course, since he gave us that eternal blood, the forgiveness of sins. There is no redemption without the blood. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.